We're going to pray, uh, ask for God's blessing upon us, and then we're going to hear from the Word of God. Let's um, bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we uh, thank you for your Word. We thank you that it is the living Word, that we can have confidence that you have spoken through it and you have uh, taught us that we can have this confidence not only in your Son, Jesus Christ, but in his Word through the power of your Spirit. And so we would pray even now, that you would lift up your son, that you would bless your people and that you would use the preaching of the word to do all those things through the power of your spirit. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Always remember an illustration uh, of uh, Canadian theologian uh, Don Carson, uh, probably 13, 14, 15 years ago when I was doing some studies in Sydney he was a visiting lecturer, and he gave this illustration. It was of the, 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 the Passover. And there's these two Jewish blokes, Adam and and living in the, the land of Goshen at the time of the Exodus. And the ten plagues on Pharaoh and Egypt are almost at an end. And it's evening, and Adam says to Dan, Dan, have you slapped the blood of the lamb around your doorposts, on your beams? And Dan replies, of course I have. You heard what Moses said. The angel of death is going to pass through the whole land tonight, including Goshen. And the firstborn of every home and the firstborn of every cattle will die unless, and the only exception is, unless by faith they've heard the words of Moses and they've splashed that blood of the lamb around the doorposts and beam." And he pauses and he says, and I'm really excited about this because of what it means is that our redemption is drawing near. The exodus is close. God is going to redeem us and set us free. And I've got my friends and the relatives are all coming over tonight and we are ready to go. How about you, Adam? And Adam says, well, of course I've done the same thing. Of course I've put the blood around the door, but I have to be honest with you, I'm worried. I mean, have you seen the devastation that those plagues have caused in Egypt? All those frogs and lice and hail, and there's just death and devastation everywhere. And now Moses said that the firstborn of every family is going to die. Apart from those who have the blood around their door. It's going to happen tonight, he said. And the angel of death is going to sweep right through the land, including, including us, through the land of Goshen. Easy for you, Dan. You have seven kids. I only have one, my firstborn. And to be honest with you, Blake, I am scared witless. Tell you what, there won't be much sleep in our house tonight, that's for sure. And Dan is surprised. Blake, why are you worried? Moses, has he not already said that, that God has promised that, that anyone who puts the, the, the blood around the doorpost, that they will be saved, that the angel of death will just go past? You heard what Moses said. Believe God put the blood on the doorpost and you and your child will be fine in the morning. Well, that night, the angel of death passes to the land of Goshen. Whose son dies? Adam's or Dan's? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because the promise isn't based on the intensity of someone's faith, nor the, the joy or the exuberance or the confidence of their obedience but on the blood of the Lamb. I mean, in one sense, who could blame Adam? After everything that he's seen, all the plagues, all, all that suffering and all that death, and now he knew that the angel of death was going to sweep through the land of Goshen. He has one son. And the angel is coming to take the firstborn of every household, including the cattle of that household, unless they go put blood around the door. 
I don't know, I, I, I think I can understand it. You see, sometimes it's just hard to actually see how God's promises are going to flesh out, how they're going to work out. And you want to trust God. But it almost seems like this, it can't work out. How will it pan out? I, I want to trust that he'll deliver, but I can't see how he will deliver. You know, you, you want to pray, but it doesn't seem to be answers. You want to obey, but you can't see how it works. You, you want to honour your parents, but they don't seem to understand. You want to love your husband, but he doesn't seem to respond. You want to tell truth, but it only brings pain. You, you want to give generously, but, but, but money's always tight. And I know what it's like when you just can't seem to see a way forward. When, when, when you do love God, but it just, everything seems such a long shot. What it's like when you stumble and you fall, when you know sin steals your joy and doubt smother your faith and hardship rots away at, at your resolve and your obedience. And you start having doubts. And our text speaks to us today about that. Because it reminds us that you are not saved by the confidence of your obedience or by the intensity of your faith, but the object of your faith. That's what saves you. The blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Christ himself is the ground of all human assurance. He's the ground of all saving faith. You need no other argument, no other plea, no other basis, no other hope on which to stand except him. Because you are not saved by the intensity of your faith or the exuberance of your obedience. You're saved by the object of your faith, which is Jesus the Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the ground and the foundation and the basis of every believer's assurance. So today, God is going to encourage our hearts as we meditate. We'll go over the text reasonably fast. And again, I'm going to concentrate mostly on verse 2, but I'll see how it all pulls together. But the point that Paul is writing is he wants to encourage them. He wants to see them reach the fullness of the assurance which is available in Christ, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So look, let's look at the text. Verse 1, chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. So here is Paul and he reminds again, I want you to understand both you at Colossae, those at Laodicea and even those I haven't met who are getting my letters, how much I struggle for you, grinding and grafting, praying, working, witnessing, even though I'm in jail. And for Paul, this isn't a job. This isn't a project. This is a calling. This is his purpose. And he wants them to know, I want you to understand and know how hard I struggle for the gospel for your sake in Colossae and Laodicea and even those who have not heard me. Why is he struggling so much? What is this struggle for? Verse 2 tells you the reason. Look at verse 2. And that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, why? To reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery. What is God's mystery? Which is Christ. He wants them to be encouraged, to be heartened, to be uplifted. In the words of Hebrews 10, 19, to have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. His motivation is their assurance to have a sureness of foot. And he, and he links this encouragement, this encouraging of their hearts, and he links it to having their hearts knitted together in love in this covenant community. It's not, it's not talking about an individual, but corporately, that the way of encouragement is the way of our hearts being knitted together in love, love for God, Vertically, but horizontally love for one another, for our neighbour, for each other. And this togetherness in love 
Our hearts will be encouraged. And in doing this, what, what is his hope for them? To reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. That's the heart of the message. This is, this is Paul's big idea. This is the major concern of the text. He wants them all at Laodicea, Colossae, even those who haven't seen face to face. Wants you to reach all the riches of full assurance. And by implication, what he's saying is it is actually possible to follow Jesus, to love God, to believe the gospel, but not reach the fullness of the riches of full assurance in Christ. It's possible that you could love Jesus, but reach only something of the riches of assurance. A partial experience or a passing experience of those riches, but not all the riches of full assurance. It's a bit like a, um, I have a tape measure here. And at first looks, it, you know, looks like your average tape measure. Uh, get this tape measure. You can't see behind me that camera is Brandon Combridge. But I can tell you this, that he's about one point, well, it's magnetic too, so it's sticking to it. But it's about 1.6 metres to, to the camera. But, so this is a great little tape measure. You can, you can tape out your wood, make your masks, do your cuff. Actually, everyone's got a tape measure like this. But just imagine you had a tape measure like this and all of a sudden a plague come over the land and you had nothing to do for weeks and months and you thought, oh, I might read the instructions. Now, of course, if you're a real bloke, you would never read the instructions. But just imagine, because of a plague, because of boredom, because you can't go anywhere, you can't ride your motorbike, you can't do anything that's of great interest, that, that you think, well, I could read the instructions. And if you were to read the instructions, you would find that not only do you have a tape measure that can go five metres, but you could turn this tape measure on, you'll find out this is a digital tape measure with a laser on it. There's a little red dot, you probably can't see it. But again, if I was to press the button, it confirms that, that he, Brandon, well, at least his computer is about 1.69 metres away. And the fact is, not only does this tell me that, but it, it can go as far as I can point it over there, if I can get it to work, yep, and it will tell me how far that wall is. And so I can start working out, that's 17 metres from here to there. And because I did this a little bit earlier, it not only tells me it can go as far as 40 metres, so all of a sudden I started off with a tape measure that, well, until there was a plague, had a, a ruler, a, a, a tape, that well, could tell me 5 metres. Now I know I have something that actually, with a laser, it can tell me it goes as far as 40 metres. But because I read the instructions, guess what? It also does area measurements. And I tested it here before. It's 70 metres this way. And, and what I, it can tell me the square metres, which is roughly in this area, it's about 302 square metres. And that's not all. Because the other night, a little bit bored, Ethan was annoying me, as he does, and he's uh, lying on, his, on, the, on the couch. He's got his little computer with his headphones on. And I realised that this tape measure also doubles up as a weapon. You can point it at someone's head or eyes and it's really distracting and annoying. And so in a very short period of time, I went from a tape measure that could, tape, that could measure five metres to something that could do 40 metres, could do a square area, and now it's become a weapon. Now, the point it is possible to have a laser tape measure, but not enjoy all of the benefits that it has to offer. So it is with Christ. So it is with the gospel. You could know Christ, love Christ, be a Christian, but not enjoy the full riches of full assurance in Christ. Because it would be possible to love Christ, but at times walk by faith, uh, by sight, not by faith. It would be possible that when hardships hang around, that your joy could just go missing. 
It would be possible that when the world is falling apart, so does your confidence. Although we know that all things work for the good of those who love me according to his purpose, which is to be like Jesus, that's not always how we roll. That's not always how we feel. That's not always truly how we think. We sometimes wonder, is God punishing me? Have my sins finally caught up with me? We sometimes even wonder, does God even care or see me? Because sometimes we walk by sight and when we do that, all the data says that things are not working the way they should. And whether it's challenges or children or career or cancer or costs or cash, all the data, when you walk by sight, it fills your hearts with doubts and fears and anxiety and maybe even bitterness. And Paul is saying it doesn't actually have to be like that. Because in Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And the more that you camp on that, the more that you fix your eyes on him, the more you realise that your salvation rests not on the shaky ground of your personal obedience or the intensity of your faith, but on the rock solid ground of Christ Jesus the only man without sin, the only man who is righteous, the only man who has loved God and neighbour perfectly, the only man who ascends the hill of the Lord and has clean hands and a pure heart, the only man that death has no claim on him and hence he is resurrected from the grave, the only man that the Father said, this is my son and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And he's the only name and the only man by which you can be saved. And Paul says, that's for what I struggle. That's what I work hard for. That you might be encouraged. That your hearts might be knitted together in love for God and for one another so that you will reach that full assurance of all the riches and the, the knowledge available in Christ. Because in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They're not in science or psychology or success, or self-reliance, or in religion, or in good works. But here is Paul saying, you know, you know where you'll find all those treasures of wisdom and knowledge that, that will enable you to reach that full assurance in Christ, in him and his gospel. That's where. You should let that seep into your heart. In Christ, in him alone, are the riches of full assurance. Are the riches of wisdom and knowledge. All those treasures in him. You see, and that's why it pivots in verse 4 and 5 where we read, I say this, I say this about Christ. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in the body, Yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good aura and firmness of your faith in Christ. He's confident. I mean, he's, he's in jail. He's not there with them, but he's confident of their faith. He's confident that they'll stand firm, but he still felt the need that though he is absent and he's rejoicing at the moment of their good order and their firmness in their faith in Christ, he says, I don't want anyone to delude you with plausible arguments. Now that's what was going on in Colossae. There was, there was these plausible arguments saying that you want to find wisdom and knowledge and salvation. It's not in Jesus. It's in all these other ways. And so Paul is writing to them and he's saying, I'm with you in spirit and I, I don't want you to buy into seemingly plausible arguments of the age. And if you think that's in our day, He'd be saying to us, and I don't want you today to be buying into the plausible arguments that you're no longer producers, but you're essentially consumers. That you're not citizens of heaven, but that you're clients of the corporations. In a day where everything is polarised, politics, where, where the left is driven by sex and the right is driven by money. And in a digital economy where the right monetizes everything and the left sexualizes everything. 
And Paul's saying, I don't want you to be misled, to be deluded, to be seduced by these cultural gospels about the good life, where sex is salvation and consumption is redemption. And while there are religious dangers, false gospels that, 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 that always somehow rest on either obedience and good works or some sort of some sort of experience, subjective experience, and that becomes the basis of your salvation. While there's always those challenges, it seems to me as your pastor that the biggest danger for all of us, for most of us at the very least, is this cultural narrative of entitlement and ease where we all become consumers and clients of the corporation, convinced somehow that that's going to be our salvation. And the point is it happens through these cultural liturgies that, we, that, that, that are foisted upon us every day through social media and through all of our interactions in culture, and we hardly even know it. So you find yourself looking each day not to Christ, but to careers or to children or to cash or to consumption. And all of those things have a way of, of, of making you walk by sight, not by faith, to find your purpose in work or achievement, to find your joy in happiness and pleasure and just, or, or rewards to find your refuge in distractions or entertainments. Listen, don't underestimate the colonising effects of culture. The whole point of culture is to colonise you. Secular liturgies which have a way of habituating within us what's important. Writing upon our hearts plausible cultural paths of happiness and contentment and success. And they're not found in Christ. The cultural gospels, they're found in success and in money and in pleasure and in recognition. And if somehow that doesn't work out for you, and for most people it doesn't work out, and you now become cynical and weary, angry or embittered, then as good clients of the corporations, you'll be offered a refuge in distraction and entertainment, which will dull your anxiety and your disappointment. Listen, don't underestimate the colonising effects of our culture. That's as big a danger as any other false religious gospels. There are false cultural gospels. And Paul is saying, I am striving, I am struggling that you might be encouraged, that your hearts together corporately as the people of God, as a covenant community, that you might be knitted together in love for, for God and for each other. And that you will not be deluded by these cultural claims of truth and meaning and purpose. And, and it seems to me that one of the best ways that you could avoid such spiritual deceptions the best way that you can avoid those colonising effects of culture is to invest yourself and to commit yourself to the importance of a Christ-centred covenant community where Christ is the only basis of your assurance and salvation, where your head and your heart meet together in covenant worship and fellowship so that all of us together might reach all of the riches of full assurance in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen? Then let's pray. Our oh, Father in heaven, our great shepherd, you have stood on the hills beside us today and we have seen you and we have heard your voice and as your sheep, we want to follow our good shepherd. Guide us into green pastures where we might feast upon Christ and his righteousness and obedience. That the gospel rod and staff will guide and protect us. That we will all grow and reach 
the fullness of assurance that is in Christ Jesus so that our hope is in him as the object and the ground and the foundation of our righteousness and salvation. Therefore, we pray, strengthen the hand of the weak, I encourage those who are struggling with doubt, lift us all up in the Lord Jesus Christ and knit us together in love in our hearts that we might all reach that fullness of assurance in Christ Jesus, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.